language as reinforcement to the sort of um, the the felt power dynamic that you that you encountered when you entered the room, or or would you say that language was part of the induction process as well? Like you were attracted to Anna because you heard of something that she had said to somebody else, or you read an essay by her or something like that, and so you went. I think it's it's more that that in that induction process there is an ideology that is being delivered and and in many ways this yeah. is just normal right this is this this is how it is to whatever kind of human situation you're in is that there's there is a language that encodes a set of beliefs and ideas that everyone uh, is sort of staying on board with if they stick around within that context right. Matthew, we've ta- we've talked about this before, but I think it's a good time to revisit and, and explore it briefly, uh, because I really love the conversational aspect between you and Amanda, Julian. And it flowed; it just flowed so well when two people are, you know, on the same page and can really think about ideas in that manner. Uh, so. I wonder when you opened up by saying that most cult researchers are over 65, but we've talked about how the digital world is opening up new uh, 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 opportunities for indoctrination. Right. And I mean, again, the anti-vaccination thing, QAnon, all of that is indicative of that. So have you noticed any changes? We've talked about staring into the camera and using that technique, which is done in person, but have you noticed changes in language that people have had to use because they're not in person anymore with, and the people can't see the same pantomimes and feel the presence in the same way? You know, I think that it's a, it's almost like a McLuhan question about the intensity and the length of particular, uh, um, portions of content. Uh, I think that like Julian, when you did your bonus episode on Adi Da, you played a couple of excerpts from these really long, um, uh, 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 lectures that he would give. And there's something about that, uh, format that I don't think would play in the TikTok era. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think there's a reason that Christiane Northrup limits herself to 12 minutes. I think there's a reason that Lori Laud limits herself to eight minutes or whatever, whatever it is. I think there's a reason that Phil Good almost always hits the seven minute mark or something like that. Well, it's because se- seven is a magical number though. Well, yeah, there's that, but I mean, there's also, but so there's also, there's some kind of like a compression Mm-hmm. Uh, going going on uh, that has to do with competing with other sources of visual stimulation, yes, and also and also a sense of urgency. Uh, so, I what I would say is that is that when people are using cultish language in the digital era, they have to extrovert out of the screen in order to really capture your attention in almost a spiritually pornographic way. Whereas if you were attracted somehow into Anna Forrest's room, you came to the room, you were there and, and then you were, then you were a captive audience. There was no, she didn't have to go out and get you. But I, I think that, I think that uh, people like Elizabeth April uh, have to literally leap out of the screen at you in super high D nuclear, you know, uh, visuals and incredible makeup and filters and lighting and shit like that. And they have to basically dominate your visual field. And and that's, that's quite different. So the, so the, the performance aspect has to go up and it also has to be snappy. And if you noticed, if you open up Phil Good's, um, you know, uh, his, his selfie sermons, uh, they start with this very quick. So I just wanted to jump on here and tell you about you know, what I heard from the channels or what I heard from my sources or something like that. Like he's passing on a secret. I think we've said this before about Lori Lott from the next room. It's like, I was just taking a crap and the, and the, and the Lemurians told me that I had to come out and I did, I hardly had time to wipe my ass. I'm like, are you kidding? (laughs) Okay. I have to do it. I have to accept this assignment, but you know what else it's like, Matthew, is it's an aside. It's a breaking of the fourth wall. It's like, uh, I'm I'm in my life, which is this amazing movie. And I'm just going to pause and yes. look right at the screen and tell you this thing. <laughs> it's very postmodern that way. And yes. actually, and that's a really good model to look at it from actually, because, because when, when Anna Forrest or when Michael Roach or when Charles Anderson are running a room, they are 
on stage. They are the center of attention. They can break the fourth wall, but they're not going to do it with irony. They're not mm, going to do right. it because they are competing with other sources of um, of, of stimulation. They don't have to. Uh, they they know they know that they've 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 got that capture going on. You mentioned Elizabeth April, and I remember in one of her videos where she was talking about you know sickness being part of the spiritual transmission. She's not the For only sure. one, but I specifically remember that. And uh, ironically or not, just before recording, I was reading an article on National Geographic where they the word nausea, nos, comes from sea because of seasickness. And seasickness is compared to car sickness. It's all about motion. Motion, well, right. new research has shown that scrolling through social media produces the same cognitive effects as seasickness. Mm. Oh. So I wonder... <laughs> how much that plays and if there's any length of the videos or if there's any sort of process, if there's any cognitive disassociation happening with that sickness that happens when people are tethered to their phone for so long that makes them more vulnerable to being indoctrinated. And then the person on the screen says, I know what you're feeling right now. Mm -hmm. You may be ha you may be experiencing <laughs> this, and let me explain it to you. It's, it's symptoms of ascension, right? Right. And, as and ascension is about moving upward the same way that the uh, scrolling <laughs> it's kind of funny the, the the thing that the thing that i wanted to return to a little bit about um what might be primal or beneath the language that becomes uh, its own aspect of administration and control and, and reinforcement in the cult is the 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 body sense of being around people who are scared and who are in deference. And, and, you know, there's this funny thing, uh, you, you know, listeners might know that I did this bonus episode, but it was kind of a canceled bonus episode because I had written about a wellness influencer that I was, but then I, I, I decided not to because it felt like it was punching down. But one of the ways in which I was trying to rationalize this essay about this person was by focusing on what they had to say about not having friends. And one of the things this person kept saying as she went on and on about not having friends was that she had no patience for and no idea of how to do small talk. And at one point they talked about how, you know, if you came over to my house, we would go deep and we would not talk about anything like superficial and we would, and, you know, and, you know, I don't even know how to do, to, to do small talk. It sounded like a complete nightmare. Like you would be cornered by somebody, uh, in, in a bar or something. And I think what she was, what they were also saying was that they couldn't use anything but cultish language. They couldn't, they didn't know how to use anything but charged terms, but thought terminating cliches. And, and it made me think, I had this realization, which is that uh, the opposite of cultish might be small talk because you can't do small talk in a cult because the focus of small talk is not ideology. The focus of small talk is not like figuring out where you are in the dominance hierarchy. I mean, it might be in some respects, in some circumstances, but that's not the main thing that's going on. It's about easing social anxieties. It's about beginning to explore, uh, you know, your relationship and your possible shared interests. And if you do that in a cult, that happens outside of the shadow of the leader. And so small talk might lead to a kind of unsanctioned intimacy between two people and that threatens the power structure. Yeah, I also, I also hear someone like that saying, I don't know how to have a conversation with you that is not about influence or control or, exactly. or indoctrination, right? Exactly. And they even admit it's totally exhausting. And so I rarely find people who are willing to go there and be exhausted with me totally. I'm like, holy fuck. Yeah, it's totally exhausting because you're talking about domination and control like all the time. Anyway, I, I, I also realized that my aversion, I, I thought this was temperamental, uh, that I have this aversion to small talk in my neighborhood. And I think that it's not temperamental. I think it's partly related to these cult experiences, which trigger feelings of shame or embarrassment when I'm talking to someone without a clear objective. Uh, so it's kind of a, like a nasty social 